compassion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body and the blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us in the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal God, in whose mercy is sentence and the treasury of compassion is inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us that in difficult moments we may not despair and become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, Jesus I, trust I trust in you. In you. Jesus, Jesus, I trust, I trust in, you. in you. Excellent. Can you please be seated? So I'd like to welcome you all to our, uh, our program, which is a, somewhat an extension of what we just finished about two weeks ago, but it's going to be a little bit different. And also, uh, today we're going to be giving several gifts. We're going to be giving you uh, uh, a new Bible, and that Bible will be, will be yours. We'll give you also a, a new rosary that a man gave me, 200 new rosaries, so we'll give you a rosary. And also, at the end of our uh, night, we'll be giving you a scapular. And then at the door, we'll be giving you more material so that this course can be very efficacious. So we have a, a lot to cover in a relatively short period of time. So what I'd like to do right away is um, I'm going to try to give you an overview of the Bible. Okay, so an overview of the Bible, then we'll give you uh, your Bible, and we're going, to be, we're going to be blessing the Bible, have a formal ceremony of the blessing of the Bible, as well as a scapular. And um, I would say, uh, be very thankful that when I was your age, uh, I didn't have my own Bible. We had one Bible for, for the whole family, and... Uh, the fact that you're going to have your own Bible as a teenager is is pretty good. Uh, but, of course, uh, the Bible is not simply a Christmas decoration ornamental, but rather the Bible is meant to be read and meditated upon. So, um, probably most of you have a Bible at home, uh, but probably most of you uh, don't really know the books in the Bible, how to read the Bible, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, who's the author of the Bible, what are the Gospels, what's the difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you've got John. There's a lot of things that we have to learn in the Bible. Even though I have a degree in theology, I'm still reading and studying the Bible. Until I die, I'll be reading and studying the Bible. So I'm going to give you a mere introduction to the Bible today. And then we'll give you uh, your own Catholic Bible. Just that you're aware of this is that the Bible is the most famous book in the world. 
And many people read the Bible. Maybe you know that the Jewish people, they read the Bible. Okay? They read the Bible, but they just read the, the Old Testament. Then you have the Protestants that read the Bible, but their Bible has seven books less than our Bible. The Jehovah Witnesses read the Bible, but they have a poor translation of the Bible. The Mormons have their Bible, so it is the most famous book in the world. But it is a book that it's not always easy to read and understand the Bible. It's not always easy to read and understand the Bible. The, the author of the Bible is, is God. The author of the Bible is God. The Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible. But then you have also human individuals that God utilized to write down the Bible. And each human individual has a different personality. Okay, so he's a different personality. Once you get to read the Bible, if you read Matthew, is very different than Mark. Okay, Mark is very different than Luke. Luke is very different than John, but they're it's still the Word of God. You're going to have four different, four different personalities that God utilizes. So, um, I'd like to start off by telling a, a, a story, a personal story, on what most people think about Catholics and the Bible. So, it's a personal anecdote in my, my own life. Uh, my father, who I love very much, he died seven years ago. Okay? Uh, my, da my dad died seven years ago, almost eight years ago. And I uh, always had a very good relationship with my father. My mom is still living. She's 92. Okay? And her mother lived in three centuries. Think about that. My grandmother lived in three centuries. You're probably thinking that that's impossible. She was born in 1898, and she died in the year 2002. She lived to be 104, my grandmother. But my father, uh, my relatives were brought up and raised in Detroit, Michigan. And my father moved to New York. So my dad, uh, if you're living in Detroit and you're motivated, 70 years ago, very few people would go to college. Very few, but my dad went to college, and his father went to college too. So where would, where would he go? He went to Michigan State. So when he was going to Michigan State, he was studying economics. There was a very famous uh, history professor, the most famous history professor in Michigan State. This would be back about 75, 80 years ago. And um, the history professor, you know, Michigan State is not a Catholic university. It's a secular university. The professor said, the very famous professor said, as you know, Catholics don't read the Bible. And my father, who never had a shy bone in his body, which means my dad is very blunt and direct. My dad raised his hand. He said, Professor, you're wrong. <laughs> and he said that I went to Catholic school for 12 years. I studied with the Jesuits in Detroit. And they gave us a Bible. And we learned how to read the Bible. Now, what would happen if a college student today would contradict a professor? Obviously, he'd be kicked out. He'd be canned. But those were different times. This is a very famous professor. He said, thank you, Mr. Broom, for your intervention. In the following class, the professor came in and he apologized to my father. He said, I apologize to Mr. Broom and all you Catholics here, I apologize because I, I studied it and I recognize that some Catholics do read the Bible. I thought that the Catholics would not read the Bible. They'd read the Lives of the Saints, but they would never read the Bible. So this is 75 years ago. There were Catholics, there were Catholics that 
did read the Bible. But if you talk to Protestants, they're going to think that as a Catholic, you're illiterate with the, with the Bible. That's still a false concept that's out there. So if you, and you go to school, talk to a, a Baptist or a Lutheran or a Methodist or an Anglican or Episcopalian, they're going to think that you're a Catholic, that you don't know the Bible. So we want to disprove that. We want to disprove that. We want to... We want to prove by this mini course we're, we're going to have that we're going to get to know the Bible. And I'll show you how there are many teenagers that don't know the Bible. I've been teaching confirmation for 30 years here. So I've been teaching confirmation for many years. And um, on one occasion I gave the boys in the class, I gave them a Bible, the Bible that you're going to receive. And I said, okay, right now, I pulled, out, I pulled out a $20 bill and I said, whoever finds Mark 17, 17 first, I'll give $20. So they were all floundering. They were going through Genesis and Psalms and St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians. And then finally they found the Gospel of Mark. And they go through Mark 2, 5, 12, 15, 16, and then it was Luke chapter 1. <laughs> and I told them whoever could find Mark 17, 17, 17, I would give the $20. There's no such thing as Mark 17, 17. And I just proved to them that they were ignorant. If you really knew the Bible, you would know how many chapters are there in Mark. Now, hopefully by the end of today, I'll ask you, okay, how many Gospels are there and how many chapters are there in Matthew? 28. How about Mark? I told you. 16. How about Luke? Say, now if you were Protestant, you'd know this, but you're you know, Catholic or ignorant of the Bible, no? Don't be, I'm not insulting you, it's just that we have this this Catholic biblical illiteracy, which is deploring. It really is. It's deploring, it really is. That's why I hope that after this class, these basic trivia that we're going to be going today, you'll be able to rattle it off and show that you really do know the Bible. Okay, how, many, how many chapters in John? 21. Okay. How many, how many in Matthew? You already forgot. Come on. <laughs> Wake up and smell the coffee. Okay. Matthew 28. How about Mark? Luke? 24. <laughs> and John? Okay, good. Now, the, you go home and you, you ask your mom and your dad that they're going to be they're going to be scratching their head. I don't know. So one upmanship with your parents, right? Okay, so let me give you an overview and now an overview of the Bible, and one minute, is, uh, our, our, but our purpose in this class is, I first thought it would be best just to give you Matthew chapter 20, Matthew, and you read one chapter a day, so we've got four weeks, and seven times four is 28, right? So there you have it. But I thought if you've never read the Bible, and some of you have never read the Bible seriously, you're just going to read it and say, what the heck is this? So I purposely chosen 28 chapters, and what I'm doing is I take the chapter, I give you the, the chapter and the verses, then I give you a succinct literary summary of it. I'm a good writer, as you know, hopefully you know. And then after that, I give you some points that can help you. And the purpose is that all of you through this course are going to fall in love with Jesus Christ. Okay, that's my goal. You hear me? That's my goal, is that all of you will fall in love with Jesus Christ. Now, if you don't fall in love with Jesus Christ, you know what's going to happen in your life? You're probably going to fall in love with drugs and drinking and pornography and the casino and all those things. I'm making a prophecy now. If you, don't fall, if you don't fall in love with Jesus Christ, you're going to fall in love with a false god. That's a prophecy. Okay, did you hear me? 
I, I, I'll repeat it. If you do not fall in love with Jesus Christ, there's so many false gods, idols out there that they're going to win your attention. So my desire for you is that in this course, you're going to have a mystical experience where Jesus is really going to touch your heart. And you're going to say, he's going to be the center of my life. That's my intention. And I'm going to be starting the novena. I'm going to be praying for you nine days in a row, starting tomorrow, that God is going to hear my prayer, and he will because I'm asking with faith. Jesus said, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Jesus is going to hear my prayer. All of you are going to have a mystical experience where Jesus is going to touch your heart and you're going to believe that he is the purpose of your life. As they say in French, raison d'être, the reason, the reason for being, okay? Your reason for being is Jesus Christ, okay? All right, thanks uh, to Elvira. She made a PowerPoint for me to make it, uh, make it very clear. So this is just going to give you an overview, okay? The overview of... Okay, the overview of the Bible. No. That's the first one. So here we go. Okay, so start with this. Okay. Okay, so uh, the, the priest there that you see, his name is St. Ignatius of Loyola. Okay, St. Ignatius of Loyola, the very famous priest, and he's the one that gave the spiritual exercises. So what I've, I've tried to do over the past couple of weeks is to write a spiritual exercise size of program for, for teenagers, for all of you. So uh, in my free time, I've been writing a lot, so I've composed one for teenagers. So here is our patron saint. His name is Saint Ignatius of Loyola. Saint Ignatius of Loyola. And um, I ha I, by the way, I have a first class relic of Saint Ignatius which means I have a little piece of his bone in, in my room. And um, perhaps before the end of this course, I'll give you a blessing of this relic of St. Ignatius of Loyola, which is a little bone of this great saint. That's uh, a great privilege. So he says, getting to know Jesus is your best friend. If you do the spiritual exercises, the, the most important purpose is we want to get to know Jesus Christ who is truly our best friend. That is, that is really the, my goal and purpose of these four weeks, that Jesus Christ will truly be your best friend. Okay, and it's going to be done through the Bible. 
So this is our course, the 11th, 18th, 25th, August 1st, teenagers. We start with the rosary, okay, the talk. Then starting next week, then we will have the group sharing. Okay, here's a here's an overview now of the Bible. Okay, the books of the Bible. Okay, one of the best analogies I can give is this. A library. Okay, and now that you've got the internet, you got your phone, you probably don't go to the library as often as we used to go. But see, see the Bible. The Bible is like a library. Okay, it's, it's like a, it's God's library. Now, if you go to the library, you're going to be noticing there are many different types of books. Many different types of books. On the shelf, you can see the botany books. You can see biology, cosmology, physics, and chemistry. In literature, you got fiction, you got poetry, you got prose, you got Shakespeare, you got Milton, you got Byron. All these different types of books. There are books, but each one is different. So the Bible, the Bible has different types of literary genre. For example, in in the Bible, you're going to have poetry. Okay, you're going to have poetry. If you've ever heard of the Psalms, the Psalms of the Bible, that's mystical, that's mystical poetry. The Psalms, the 150 Psalms. If you've ever heard of Isaiah, I call Isaiah would be the Shakespeare of the Bible. Isaiah is very beautiful, if you like language. The images, the similes, the metaphors, the analogies, the use of words, it's just, if you like language, and I'm a language major, I'm an English major, I love it because it's such beautiful, beautiful language. Beautiful language. So the Bible is going to be a whole series of different books with different literary forms. They're called literary genre in technical English literature. Okay, so I'm going to go through the basic, the basic division. You know, the Bible, okay, the Bible is divided into two basic parts. It would be the Old Testament and the New Testament. You've probably heard that, right? So you've got the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you ever meet a Jewish person with a yarmulke on, maybe you met a Jewish person, they have the Bible, but it's just the Old Testament because they don't accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God. So we've got the two parts, the Old Testament, and then we've got also the New Testament. And um, every one of the books in the Bible are inspired by God, but God has utilized a human instrument to write it down. The Bible are divided into, into section, but also books. In the book you have a chapter. The chapter, you have a verse. And the verse, sometimes you got sub, you got verses that are sometimes divided into two parts. I don't know if you study grammar. Do you know what a simple sentence is and a compound sentence is? Okay, a simple sentence, you got the subject and the predicate, right? Whereas a compound sentence, you're going to have a clause or several clauses that follow, okay? So sometimes you're even going to see Okay, Luke 10, 15, 1b. That would be a compound sentence. In other words, a sentence is much more, much more lengthy. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's go back to the Old Testament. Okay, the Old Testament, can you see it where you're at? Pretty clear? Can, can you see it? Pretty clear. Okay, the Old Testament, okay, we start with the first part of the Old Testament. It's called the Pentateuch. Can you say that? Okay, say it again. It's good to, it's good to get to know the vocabulary, okay? I remember one occasion, my brother was writing articles for a medical journal. I'm an English major. I couldn't understand half of his words because it's a technical language of, of a doctor. So 
So part of, part of learning the Bible is getting to know the language. Like if I were talking to you boys, you guys, I, I could use baseball language that maybe you don't know because you don't know baseball well. Can of corn, what's that? That's a papa. How about a suicide squeeze? You probably don't know what it is, no? Like a suicide squeeze. That's when you bunt, okay? You bunt, you try to lay it down so the guy running into third base will make it and they'll make a run. That's called a suicide squeeze. So even every matter has specific language. So the Bible has a language too. Okay, the Pentateuch. If you speak with a Jew, it's called the Torah. Okay, T-O-R-A-H. The Torah. We call it the Pentateuch. So the, the Bible is written in, in what language? Okay, it's written first, it's written in Aramaic and Greek. Okay? So if you want to be an expert in the Bible, you'd have to know Aramaic, the language of Jesus, and Greek. Then it was eventually translated into our language, called the vernacular. And who did that was a man named St. Jerome. So St. Jerome was a biblical scholar that lived in the time of St. Augustine in the 400s, he translated into what's called the Vulgate, in which he translated the Bible from the Greek and the Aramaic into Latin. And then from Latin into Spanish and Italian and Portuguese, that's called the Latin language. Then into Germanic language, English and, English and German. Okay? So if we go to the original language of the Bible, it's not English or Spanish or Portuguese, it's Aramaic and Greek. And then Latin. Then Latin, then our own languages. Got that? So if you really wanted to, you really wanted to be an expert in the Bible, then you have to study Aramaic and Greek and Latin. But given that none of us are going to get our doctorate in biblical studies within the next couple of weeks, this is good enough for us. Okay, pent. Pent, what does that mean in Greek? Five. Pentateuch. So the first five books of the Bible are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and this is hard to pronounce, maybe we can learn it today, it's called Deuteronomy. Can you say that? Deuteronomy. Try to say it again. Deuteronomy. Okay, Deuteronomy, okay, nomos, Deuteronomus, it means the second law, okay? Pentateuch means the first, it means five. So the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. Okay, got it? Logical, right? Okay, the author of the Pentateuch is God. But God utilized a man, his name is Moses. You've heard of Moses, right? So those first five books are attributed to Moses as the human author. The analogy they give is, pencil and the person that's writing. Okay? The person that's writing is God and the pencil would be the human author. Okay? That's called in philosophy human instrumentality. Okay? Human instrumentality. All right. From the Pentateuch we move down to what are called the historical books. And they are Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah. Okay, those are called the historical books. And in those, the basic theme you're going to find in that are the kings that God gave for the Jewish people. Did you know that God did not want them to have kings? Did you know that? You know why? Because he wanted to be their king. And they were very stubborn and said, We want kings! God said, This is going to happen. Bad, 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 bad. We still want kings. And as a result of that, most of the kings, they fell flat on their face. The greatest king, his name was King David. And he had a son, his name was Solomon. But most of the kings made many, many mistakes because God said, I want to be your king. They said, no, we want a human king. So in those books, you're going to see 
the kings, and many of them, most of them, made pretty serious mistakes. And that be for us, we want God to be our king, right? We want God to be our king. That's why we say, que viva Cristo Rey. We want Christ to be our king. All right, then we've got, they're called biblical novellas, in which you have these beautiful stories. Tobit, Judith, Esther, Maccabees 1 and 2. Now, oh, yeah, right. Okay, right here. Now, the Protestants, okay, you've heard the word Protestant, right? The Californian usually say uh, Christians. We in the, on the East Coast, we say Protestants. Protestants are those that separated themselves from the Catholic Church. Have you heard of Martin Luther or Henry VIII? Okay. They were the ones that started what is called the Protestant Reformation back in the 1500s. And as a result of that, they separated themselves from the Catholic Church. So when you're talking with a Protestant, who founded the Catholic Church? Who founded the Protestant Church? Henry VIII, who was an adulterer. It's true. That's the most powerful argument. Okay, who founded the Protestant Church in England? It was Henry VIII who committed adultery many times. He's the founder of the Protestant Church in England. In Germany, the guy's name is Martin Luther. And if you go to, uh, you go to um, Switzerland, his name was John Calvin, Swingley, Melanchthon. Those were the founders of the Protestant of the Protestant religion. And sad to say, most of them were priests. Martin Luther was a priest. Calvin was a priest. <laughs> Henry VIII was not a priest. So they have 66 books in the Bible. These are books that they don't have. Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2, Esther, Judith, and Tobit. And so they have 66 books. We have 73 books. So our Bible, our Bible has got seven more books than them. And who, did, who determined that? It's called the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent in Italy determined that the, the, these are the canon of the Bible, the books that have been inspired by, by the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's move on. Now, these are, next books are called wisdom books. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Wisdom, and Syrac. These are books that contain wisdom. Probably the one that you know most would be this one right here, the Psalms. And the Psalms would be the best book in the world on prayer. Now, if you wanted to learn to pray by yourself, you just open up the Psalms and you read a psalm every night. There are 150 of them. That's a lot. So, so the Psalms is the, is the prayer book par excellence. And we as priests, once we become deacons, we, we make two promises. Celibacy, okay, not to get married. And the second would be, we make the promise to pray, to pray these Psalms, okay, right here. Every, we pray those psalms every month, 150 psalms. It's called the Liturgy of the Hours. So we pray them every day for ourselves, but also for our people and for the sanctification of the church. All right. So those are the wisdom books. Now we have, from that, we have the prophetic books. Um, this division is... Uh, a little bit different than I've usually given the talk, but the prophetic, the, the prophetic books can be divided into the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets are four, and they would be Isaiah, okay, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Okay, I'll repeat. Okay, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel. Why are they called the why are they called the major prophets? Because they have more chapters than the other prophets. 
Isaiah's got more than 60 chapters. So those are the most famous prophets. But then you have the minor prophets. So look at all the prophets we have here. We got, here's Isaiah, the most famous. Then you got Jeremiah, which is another one of the major prophets. Then you have the book called Lamentations. Then you got Baruch. Then you got Ezekiel and Daniel. So these are the major ones. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and you got Ezekiel, and you got Daniel. Those are the four major. Then the others are minor prophets. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So there you have uh, the prophetic books. So this would be this would be the whole, the totality of the Old Testament for Catholics. In total, the number of books are 46. Got that? 46 books in the Old Testament. And there's 27 books in the New Testament. 46 plus 27, that is 73. So the Catholic Bible has 73 books. The Protestant Bible has 66 books. Now, this is not on the PowerPoint, but how would you how can you tell that you have a Catholic Bible? I'll tell you right away. If you have a mark if you open the book with a circle, it's called the imprimatur. Okay? You see that word imprimatur? That's Latin, which means it can be it can be printed, and you're going to see a bishop next to it. That's a Catholic Bible. I would wager probably some of your parents have a Protestant Bible. It was maybe given to them on their on their wedding or maybe the 25th anniversary, and your parents probably don't know the difference, no? But we want to make sure that we have a Catholic Bible. Otherwise, it's like driving a car with three wheels, right? Good luck, huh? You want to make sure that you've got not the 66, but you want the whole 73. Okay, let's move now from the... Okay, now we're into the New Testament. Now, the whole focus of the Bible is converging in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? So the Old Testament is a preparation for the New Testament. In the New Testament, we encounter Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's, he's the Alpha, the Omega. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the center. He's the heart. He's the summit. He's the apex. He's the zenith. He's, he's the whole focus of the Bible is leading us to Jesus Christ. All right. There we have, here we have the New Testament. The most important part of the whole Bible are the Gospels. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church points this out with great clarity. The very heart of the Bible are the Gospels. So many of the passages I'm going to be giving to you are going to be taken from the Gospel. But I'm going to give you a lot of passages this week taken from the book of Genesis. Because you have to know about creation. You have to know about Adam and Eve. You have to know about Cain and Abel. You have to know about the Tower of Babel. You have to know about Noah. You have to know about Joseph of the Old Testament. Those are key figures. So, but all of this is, is leading up to and converging with the Gospels. Okay, there we have it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Do any of you know what the word gospel means? In Spanish, evangelio. Okay, good. It means the good news. In Spanish, it's called evangelio. Good news. Good news. So there we have, we have the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All right, let's, let's check your memory. How, how many chapters in Matthew? 28. Good? How about in Mark? 16. How about in Luke? 24. How about in John? 24. Great, you got it. 
So when you go home, ask your mom or your dad, how many chapters, oh, I don't know, I have to ask Father Broom, huh? <laughs> Why don't you test them? They're going to be proud of you, no? Okay, here's another thing about the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, these are called the synoptic Gospels. Can you say that? These are called the synoptic Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're called the Synoptic Gospels because they all have basically the same themes. Whereas this one here, the Gospel of John, the last one, is very, very different because it was written around the year 100. The others were written earlier. And so the themes in the Gospel of St. John are very different than Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, let's make, let's make a brief connection between the, the Gospels and the Mass. How many, how many readings do you have on, on Sunday? Any of you recognize? Nope. Okay, there are actually three readings on Sunday. And pay attention next time. Okay? That means you're not paying attention to the readings. Okay, The first reading is usually the Old Testament. And now you remember that, huh? Okay, then after that, you have a responsorial psalm. Okay? Then after that, you can have usually a letter, a part of a letter from St. Paul. Okay, then the Gospel, you can notice on Sunday, on Sunday you have three cycles. Cycle A... B and C. Cycle A, we're going to be reading the Gospel of Matthew. Cycle B, you're going to be reading the Gospel of Mark. Cycle C, you're going to have the Gospel of Luke. So, right now, do any of you remember what Gospel we had on Sunday? How's your memory? Oh, that didn't think... Alzheimer kicked in when you were 15. Oh, I got a better memory than you, and I'm heading towards 70, no? Matthew, is Matthew 11, tw Matthew 11, 28 to 32. Don't you remember the gospel? Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, because I am meek and humble of heart you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How about that for memory, huh? See, I, I exercise my memory. I try to memorize a lot, a lot of things, and especially try to memorize a lot of the Bible. And hopefully we're going to be able to do it, not simply to memorize it, but put it into practice, too. That's even more important. So, letter A would be Matthew Letter B would be Mark. Letter C would be Luke. Okay, I'm going to throw a curveball at you now. <laughs> when we have letter B, it goes by very quickly because how many chapters in Mark? How about in Matthew? So you almost have twice as many chapters. So in this year, letter B, the church throws in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 has 71 verses. And it's got what is called Jesus walking on the waters, Jesus multiplying the loaves. Then one of the most famous biblical discourse is called the bread of life discourse. Where Jesus says, I am the bread of life, whoever eats my body and drinks my blood. So you've got about five weeks of John chapter 6 because Mark is so short. Okay? So next year, when we're into letter B, you'll probably remember that. Yeah, wow, Mark is already over. What's the church going to do? We're only, in, we're only into the middle of July. Ah, ah, they threw in John chapter 6 to fill in that space. Okay? Okay, so after, after the, the John, we have the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. Who is the author of the Acts of the Apostles? Da, 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 da. Okay? 
So the Acts of the Apostles, also known as the Gospel of the Holy Spirit, the author is St. Luke. So Bible commentaries will say, if you read the Gospel of Luke, you move right into the Acts of the Apostles, it's a, it's a continual biblical reading. You're going to see the same literary style and some of the major themes. So the Acts of the Apostles, if you, during, during the Easter season, we're reading the Acts of the Apostles all, those whole 50 days, the Acts of the Apostles. And we're going to meet, meet in the first few chapters, we, we meet St. Peter, then the ninth chapter, we meet Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus is converted, then all the way to the very end, you're going to have the, the person of St. Paul. Okay, that's the Acts of the Apostles. Now, talking about St. Paul, St. Paul wrote all these letters. Okay, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, this is the letter to the Irish, any Irish blood here? I've got a little bit, okay, the Galatians. Ephesians, Filipinos. Did I say that right? Oh, I'm sorry. Not Filipino, but Philippine. I, I always mispr mispronounce it. Okay. Okay. So it's the Phil Philippians, not Filipinos. Okay. Colossians, 1 Thessalonians. Two Thessalonians, one Timothy, two Timothy, Titus, Philemon, letter to the Hebrews. Then you have, these are called the Catholic letters. Do any of you know what the word Catholic means from Greek? Good, it means universal. Kataholos means universal. So these letters, these letters, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, they're written to a specific community where these Catholic letters written to the whole world. That's what Catholic means, universal, written to the whole world. So here we have James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. Then there's a very short letter written by the Apostle Jude. Very short letter. Then the last book of the Bible is the book, it's called the book of Revelation. Did you ever hear the word apocalypse? What's the difference between Revelation and apocalypse? Okay, this would be the difference. What's the difference between John, Juan, Giovanni, Jean? They spoke in four different languages there. I'll say it again. Okay, John, Juan, Giovanni, Jean. Okay, I said the same name in four different languages. Jean would be the French, Giovanni is Italian, okay. Juan is Spanish and John is English. So there are four different names for the same person. So Revelation is the language is called Latin, whereas the Apocalypse would be the Greek. So it's the same book, but Latin and Greek. Got it? Yeah. All right. So right now, uh, we're going to have our Bible facts and trivia. We're going to be passing out your cards, and we're going to be filling in this Bible trivia quiz. And all of you have your own pencil, right? Yeah. Now you can ask some of the servers. Okay, so we've got the Bible facts and trivia. Bible facts and trivia. Oh, it's not, okay. But 
Okay, so you all have your card. Short a pencil, just raise your hand and you'll get a pencil. You got your card, raise your hand, you'll get your card and your pencil. Okay, so let's go for it. How many? Okay, so books <laughs> in the Catholic Bible. Okay, you got it. 73. Okay, you're jumping the gun, huh? So in the Old Testament, okay, the Old Testament, you got, right, we got 46. Old Testament, 46. So New Testament, we've got 27. So put below that, together, how many? 46 plus 27? Yeah. Okay, there you have it. So you can put below New Testament 73 in total. Once you just write down 73 in total, the Old Testament and the New Testament. All right. How many Gospels are there? Okay, write down four. Okay, let's, uh, let's name the Gospels. Okay, write down St. Matthew. Okay, then after that, St. Mark. Then you've got St. Luke. Then you've got St. John. St. Matthew, St. Mark, St. Luke, and you've got St. John. Those are the four Gospels. Okay, the word Gospel means the good news. All right. Uh, we've already gone through this several times, but now you're experts with the numbers, huh? How many chapters in Matthew? 28. You got it, 28. Okay, in Mark we got 16. Okay, in Luke we've got 24. In John we've got 21. Okay, the, the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay, this, the word synoptic means in Christian, it means sameness. Sameness. So you got Matthew, Mark, and Luke are going to have the same topics or themes. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Or St. John is very different. It can be written many years afterward and to a different audience. Matthew, basically written to the Jewish converts. 
Mark and Luke to the Greek converts and Roman converts. John is written to the early Christians, so different audiences. Okay, who was the most prolific writer of the New Testament? Do you know what prolific means? It's a big word, right? Prolific would, would be the one that basically wrote most, most abundant. Okay? The most prolific would be that of St. Paul. How many books of the Bible did Paul write? Okay, let's, let's, okay, let, let, let's count. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay. Hebrews, modern scholarship says possibly St. Paul did not write it. So I'll write down... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Okay, let's move then into the next question. Uh, we already did that, right? What is an epistle? Okay, what is an epistle? Epistle means a letter, okay? So epistle means a letter. Sometimes you can hear the letter of St. Paul or the epistle of St. Paul. Letter of St. Paul or the epistle of St. Paul. All right, let's move on. Okay, when, when we ask this question, where in the four gospels can we find the passion account? What does that mean? The Passion means basically what we celebrate on Good Friday. So be, did any of you see the movie of Mel Gibson, The Passion of Christ, that movie? So the Passion would be related to the suffering of Jesus. So let's see if we can learn today where in these Gospels we can find the suffering of Jesus on the cross. Now, I'm going to try to do it in such a way that you'll be able to memorize it. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's, it's easy in this sense. Okay, the last chapter of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have the resurrection. Got that? Then the two chapters before that are the passion of Christ. I'll repeat that. So the last, the last chapter, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is going to be the resurrection scenes. Then the two chapters before that, we've got the Passion of Christ. Okay? So let's, if you can remember that, anyone ask where the Passion accounts, then in John, is, there's just a little variation, but it's not complicated. In John, you can, get, you can have two, two. Two, Resurrection, and two, the Passion. Can we write it down now? Let's go for it. Okay, so let's go. How many chapters in Matthew? Okay, so the last chapter is the resurrection. Well, then where are you going to find the passion accounts? What? 26 and? So 20, Matthew 26 and 27, you have the passion account in St. Matthew. Your parents are really going to be impressed when you tell them this one, huh? Okay, Mark, okay, how many chapters? Okay, 16 is what? The resurrection? So where do you have the passion accounts? 14, 15. All right, let's go to Luke. How many chapters in Luke? 24. That's the resurrection. How about the passion accounts? 22 and 23. There you got it. Okay, now the only difference in Luke is that you got two and two. The last two are 
the resurrection of Jesus, and the two before that would be the Passion. Okay, so you're going to find the Passion of Christ, which chapters in John? Do you remember how many chapters in John? 21, right? So the last two are the resurrection, and the two before that are the Passion, and they would be? 18 and 19. The fact that you're learning this in just one class is huge. It may take a semester in college to learn this, huh? Okay, yeah. So now let's, uh, let's name 10 miracles that Jesus performed. Now all of you, what's that? Okay, all of you know what a miracle is, right? You know what the miracles are. Miracles are things that only Jesus can do that, right? Because he's God. And Jesus did miracles to prove that he was the son of God. He said to the Sadducees and Pharisees, if you don't believe my words, believe my actions. Because only God can do miracles. So let's, uh, let's uh, write down uh, ten miracles. Okay, what, what you can maybe do, if you, could, if you know one, you can raise your hand, and then we'll see if you, see if you can do it. If you, don't, if you can't do it, I'll fill, in some, I'll fill in the blanks. Okay, raising your hand, okay. And then, okay, then you're going to write it, uh, Eric? Yeah. Go ahead. Jesus walks on water. Okay, Jesus walks on water. Great, that's one. There's more than ten, but let's see if we can get ten, ten today. Okay, Jesus walking on water is one of the many miracles. Yes? The red mess. Okay, good. Jesus turns, Jesus turns water into wine. Okay? At Cana. Oh, okay. Good. So that's two. Uh, n- next. Fatima. A little bit louder. Okay, good. Uh, uh, the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Can we put it that way? So the multiplication of the loaves and the fish. Aisha? I'm sorry, Ashley. Okay. He. Okay, good. He heals the paralytic. Is that that's number four, right? Teresa. Okay, he heals the ten lepers. That's a good one, yeah. That's five, right? He heals the ten lepers. Okay. Anyone else over here? Yes. Okay, good. He heals a blind man. Very good. You're all doing really well. Very good. Ashley, another one? Okay. Okay, good one. Can you name the person that he... Yes. It was three... Oh, good. Yes. Great. Okay. Lazarus, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Do you know where that can be found in the Bible? John chapter 11, okay? And you know where the wedding feast of Cana is? John chapter 2, okay? How about that for memory, huh? Okay, we got, is that uh, Paloma? What's that? Okay. Um, Healing the mute. Do any of you know what mute means? Sorry, Alondra. Sorry, mispronounced your name. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, Healing the, the mute. You probably see that on the internet when you got mute. What does that mean? Someone that can't speak. So that was another miracle. Good. Then uh, another one? Yes, Daniel. Daniel. The woman that touched his robe? Yeah, that's actually the the gospel for today. This woman had a very serious sickness when she was losing blood for 12 years and she touched the tassel of his cloak and healed just like that. Okay. How many do we have now? Is that nine already? Okay. Isabel, another one? 
Oh, okay, left it face on the cloth. Well, that's a little bit later. Another one? Okay, uh, you're speaking metaphorically. That's uh, let's, let's good, but another one? Okay. That I would put in the category of miracle, but also th those are exorcism. How about, how about this one? Jesus healing the deaf mute. So he healed both a deaf mute. So write that one in. Is that 10? Okay, if you want to know a baker's dozen, Jesus calming the storm. Remember there was a big storm on the lake? And Jesus said, be calmed, and the storm calmed down. Okay, great. Now, here we go now. Can you name the 12 apostles? These Catholics? Okay, let's see if we can go for it. Hopefully I won't remember, I, I won't forget one of them. I'll, I think I've got a, a pretty good memory. I think I'll get it. No, if not, it'll be good for my humility, huh? Okay, number one is Peter. Do you know them all? Do you know them all? Go, go for it, yeah. Oh, you're, you're reading it. Oh, boy. Okay, go ahead then. Peter, Andrew. James the Less, Judas, James the Greater, Bartholomew, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, Simon. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah that's good, yeah. <laughs> well done. Well, you did, you really did that well. Um, great, so here we have it first. Simon, also called Peter. Andrew is his brother. We got James, the son of Zebedee. Then we got John, his brother. Philip, okay, and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus. And Thaddeus, also known as Jude. Simon, the zealot. And last would be Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Okay, great. Well done. Well done. Who is the Prince of the Apostles? Okay, can we just go back? You wanted to copy it? And go back to the slide. You all have it? Okay. Simon, called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, also known as Jude, Simon, the zealot, and then Judas Iscariot. You remember, he betrayed him and he hanged himself. So those are the 12 apostles that you can find in the Bible. Okay, who is, who is the prince of the apostles? St. Peter. Simon Peter. Well done. Is that the one, last one? Oh. Okay, well, okay, which book of the Bible describes the early church? I'll give you a hint. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What follows Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What follows? who is also the author of St. Luke, it would be? Acts of the Apostles. So the Acts of the Apostles describes the early church. Now we're going to give you a lot of gifts. We're going to be giving you a new Bible, a new scapular. We're going to be giving you also a rosary. And at the door, we're going to be giving, we're going to be giving you a lot today. So we're going to be giving you at the door your... Meditations for this week. We're going to be giving you a handout which points out you're going to be reading my commentary and a Bible passage every week, every day of the week. So you have your own binder. You can just put that in your binder. 
and you're going to be reading and reflecting uh, every day, every day during the week. You can spend five minutes, ten minutes, half hour, an hour, as long as you want to spend on that. Okay. Right now, we're going to be doing. Yes. Okay. Right now, we're going to be blessing the the Bibles. You know. Then after the blessing, the Bible we're going to be placing placing the scapulars on you. Okay, can you please stand? Did you get the stole? Is there a stole? Okay. A white stone. Yeah. One of the altar servers, maybe you can help me out. Just grab onto the holy water. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Bible is inspired word of God. As Catholics, we believe this is the book of the church, the sacred literature of God's people. Our church encourages us to read and reflect frequently on the pages of this book so that we may be continually formed into committed disciples of Jesus Christ. Let us continue the ancient practice of asking the Holy Spirit who inspired these writings to help us as we study and pray these scriptures. May we listen to the word of God in these texts and find our nourishment and strength in its message. Please respond, come Holy Spirit, and kindle in us the fire of your love. May the Holy Spirit encourage us to give greater honor to this Holy Bible enthrone it in a place of honor in our homes and commit to frequent reflection on its pages. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in us the fire of your love. May the Holy Spirit instill in us a deep desire to know God's words so that we will grow as disciples of Jesus Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Through the Holy Spirit, may our reading of Scripture lead us to a deeper faith a more lively hope, and a more fervent love for the love for the Lord and His Holy Church. Come, Holy Spirit, and kindle in us the fire of your love. Let us pray. Saving God, you have revealed your life and your love through the lives of our ancestors in the faith, from Abraham and Sarah, Moses and David, to Mary and Joseph, and to Peter and Paul, you have spoken your word and called your people to fuller life. We honor your presence in these scriptures. We pray that the words of this sacred book may become more deeply the living word of God, forming our thoughts, desires, and actions. We ask your blessing on these holy Bibles. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, right now we're going to be blessing the scapulars, and we're going to be imposing the scapulars on you. And after we do this, you'll be able, you're going to be receiving your own Bible, a rosary, you have a scapular. You're going to receive a lot of things at the door. You're going to receive a prayer card that will teach you how to pray using the Bible. You'll also be receiving your handouts so that you're aware of it every day of the week. You'll have a biblical passage, then you'll have a commentary in that biblical passage, which, are, which is the most important part of this course. Okay? So. Father, um, we have blankets 
for the ones that have been saved in okay. the Okay. Uh, if you didn't come in the last session, you don't have a binder, uh, there at the door we'll give you a binder so we can put uh, your, your sheets. But you already have a binder from the last class. Just utilize that, okay? Good. So the blessing of the scapular. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to, the, to me except through the Father. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Holy Father, you have wished that your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, should take our human flesh in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the working of the Holy Spirit. Grant to this your sons and daughters of yours who are about to wear devoutly the scapula of the family of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel, the grace of being clothed in Jesus the Lord in all the circumstances of this life and thus to attain eternal glory through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm going to be blessing the scapulars. Where are the scapulars? Oh, they all have the scapulars. Okay, good. All right. So if you just lift up your scapula, I'll bless the scapula. So open your scapulars as she is showing you. Open it. 